Blight in Path of Exile. Now, what is this league mechanic? Well, let's go to Monkey Explanation. Monkey Explanation! <clears throat> monkey run map. Monkey see Cassia. Cassia say, It's growing exile! Monkey plays tower. Tower hit enemy. Enemy, bleh, kill all enemy. Then, shwing, 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 shwing. No, but in all honesty, when running Blight and doing this mechanic, it is quite really simple and you hang you can literally start with almost no currency. What I mean by almost no currency is literally just running a map and completing the atlas and you're bound to find a Blight mechanic somehow inside of the map. Now, I will show you in this video a special strategy that allows you to constantly run Blight maps and basically recycle your currency while gathering more as well as how to start this snowball rolling and how to defeat the blight monsters in the blight map and how to farm blight maps themselves. Also, I'll show a very early strategy for if you say only have a couple of chaos and a strategy that involves a little bit more investment. However, this investment is still so minimal for the amount of return that we get. And if you just want to, I don't know, have, have a chill time, play some towers and play tower defense, this is a league mechanic for you. So how does this strategy work? Essentially, when we have our Atlas passive tree, which I will also link in the description, we run strong boxes for a little bit of extra currency. I personally like harvest, so I also take harvest because sometimes I like to craft and do stuff like that. But the most important thing is going to be obviously blight. Uh, taking the blight nodes is important. So let's go and talk about the nodes very quickly. What does this node do? Well, basically it gives us a 10% chance to contain an oil extractor, which basically is just saying that your maps have a 10% chance to contain uh, 15 chaos. Uh, every single time you drop one of these and then oils found in your maps, which is also very important for this node is has a, has a 25% chance to be one tier higher. What does that mean and why is this important for us? Since we also run the one and only important sextant that we run is oils in your map have each uh, are one tier higher. So what does that mean? That means that every single time we are supposed to drop, for example, an opalescent oil, we have a 25% chance for it to be one tier higher, and then the sextant also applies that to be one tier higher. So technically, we have a 25% chance that when we drop, for example, an opalescent oil, that it is going to be a golden oil. So that is a very important node. And also these oil extractors, which destroys an anointed item that extracts one of those oils. So whenever we have a item, let's say, for example, we have Breath of Lightning, and we can see that it has a golden oil being used with a violet and a, well, blue. We can use this oil extractor in order to extract one out of three chance a good oil out of it. So from 15C or 14, I just extracted one golden oil from that anointed amulet that we get dropped from the maps, which is amazing. So that's the, why we take this. Now... The still fungus, that just means that we get that anointed jewelry that I was just talking about, and then again we have an additional blight boss. This one makes things easier, blight monsters just take more damage and our pump in our map has more durability. Now, uh, Labyrinth, this is just an extra thing, maybe sometimes you can get lucky and get a gift of a goddess if, if, you, if you can do it. Now, the bread and butter of this whole strategy. Varied varieties of items contained in three blight chests in your maps are lucky, beautiful, nice addition of currency. Blight chests in your maps have 80% more chance to contain bladed maps. This is the whole cherry on top of our strategy. This one node. We wouldn't need anything else but this one node and we would get so many blight maps. This is just an amazing node that allows us to get so many maps, which you will also see later how many we actually got after running only 12 maps with this one node. Now, it's also nice to take these small nodes here because it also gives us uh, more lucky chests and additional rewards, which is amazing. And then here, again, for this Blight, uh, we have uh, spawn more non-unique monsters, and then they spawn 100% faster, meaning that we can just clear 
the blight faster in our maps, meaning that we can just continue and run another map much quicker. And this is just reduced cost of building and upgrading towers. So this whole strategy bases off of that. And also as an addition for your extra point, uh, it's good to just go for that extra quant. And I just, since I always like to kill the boss, um, farming these map bosses is another really cool thing that you can do as well as, you know, every other strong box. And I go for Eater of Worlds, but you can also go Searing Exarch without any problem. As you can see here, we need this node anyways. So it doesn't really matter if you go two points down here or if you just go another point down here and I could save another point if I actually went Searing Exarch. So that's the Atlas tree, which will be linked in the description. This is the bread and butter of the build. That just means that every single time we run a map, we have a high chance of getting a Blight map from the Blight mechanic itself. So regarding uh, the strategy, the investment is as listed here. These are going to be the calculations and you are going to see them on your screen right now. This is our investment into these 12 maps. The sextants are so cheap. The scarabs, the cartography scarabs, they're really cheap. And these gilded blight scarabs, it don't, they don't need to be gilded. You can have any other way to add blight. You can use, for example, a sextant that is, for example, just blight encounter. It doesn't really matter, but I like the 50% chance for extra rewards. It's always some extra juice. It always adds up. For this investment running 12 maps, you will also see like how much currency we managed to accumulate only after 12 maps. And I'm saying only because it's 12 maps, like what sample size is that? And this is consistent currency. I can assure you it's consistent currency because in the calculations that I'll show you soon, you can see that this is consistent. You can see that I also removed the non-consistent things to show how much you know currency you can actually make. So now going to like just how much we accumulated through those 12 maps, um, I, I loaded in um, on PoE stack on my dump tab, which I threw absolutely everything I got from the map into there. And I'm not counting in lucky drops. What I count say by lucky drops are those things that have like those high weight value items that you won't always get, right? Like two golden oils, golden oils you will get. So after discounting things like the Kirax memory that we managed to get lucky dropped, um, the Crimson Temple maps, which we are going to then, like I mentioned before, recycle into running another, let's say 14 Crimson Temple maps that we can now use in order to just, all we need to do is buy the Sextants again and buy the Scarabs again. And we can reuse these maps. So I'm not counting them as profit since we're just using them. We farm them. Stack decks are consistent. Oil extractors are consistent drops. Uh, sextants are quite consistent drops as well. Opalescent and silver oils as well. Uh, life force is also going to be consistent because like I mentioned, if you want to do that, it is going to be consistent for me since I have been choosing harvest in my like uh, Atlas tree as well, as well as all of these uh, strong boxes. So the strong boxes, the harvest, um, all of the currency items that we are getting from these maps are going back into our tab here, which also accumulates to all of our profits here, which I am counting in. So let's say that after 12 maps, we have 5.5 divines, and that's not counting the lucky drops. If we actually do count everything, it's going to put us at 7.6, which let's say that it is an average of six divines, okay, for, for just this test. Six divines from 12 maps means that you are averaging half a divine per map ran. And this is without really running the blight maps yet and without running the other things. Now, this is where we get to the good part. We have farmed a total of 16 blighted maps just from those 12 maps. So we are actually dropping more blight maps than we ran, which we can also test later on. Tell me how, you, how many you get. But sometimes, remember, you'll have bad blights, but in the majority, you will have an average after some time. So don't get scared that, oh, I'm not getting anything, don't do anything, you know, about that. So essentially, also, remember, do not take singular focus. Because if you say, oh, I will take singular focus because I want to drop more blighted crimson temple maps, yeah, no, no, don't do that. Because now every other technically blight map that you were supposed to drop is going to be converted into currency. And well, you're changing a blight map into like four orbs of transmutation. That's not worth it. So now after calculating all of that, we have some blight maps to run. Now, how do you run these blight maps and what is important about them? I have like two or three very important things that I want to mention. 
So the most important oils for you when running normal blight maps, I'm not talking about blight ravage maps, normal blight maps, is when we run this map, how blight maps work is that if we add quantity and we add rarity, for example, Alk and Going, um, these mods will apply to the mobs, which we don't really care about because like I mentioned, these annoyance are going to be really important. So our meteor towers create burning ground and burning ground affects fire immune monsters, meaning that they will be getting well damage over time. And then our chilling towers, well, they are constantly basically freezing every single monster that's around us. And for a low cost of, well, editing time, you can absolutely just run maps without a problem and kind of basically AFK. But I have to mention, I can't stress this enough, help your towers out. You're there for a reason. You're not only placing towers. If you couldn't attack, then I understand, but you can attack. It will make it easier and faster, less stressful, less FPS <laughs> loss. You know, just, just, just help those towers out, okay? It's not a problem. Just be careful. When running these maps, we add that item quantity because the quantity does not apply to small blight cysts. However, it does apply into the big blight cyst, meaning that initial big loot drop that goes around our uh, blight pump. So, meaning that I did manage to get a couple of good lucky drops, but essentially it's not that important. Why we add this quality is just for a random chance of maybe dropping something good. But the most important here, the, the most important thing here is going to be a Val Orb. We need to Val our maps. Now, if you feel uncomfortable running rare Vault maps, that's fine. You can just Val them as white with some quantity. So four chisels and a Val it. Running a map like that is going to be slightly easier for you killing the mobs, but you sh still shouldn't have really a lot of problems when running them rare. Now, why do we vol these maps? We vol them because of a very special oil called the Tainted Oil. You manage to get Tainted Oils from corrupted Blight maps. So corrupting these maps is always a good option. Now, um, problem is that I have done a mistake here because we do not, and this is an example of what you should not do. <clears throat> this is not because I absolutely forgot about this. It's an example <laughs> to show you why it is important to first, when you have your blight maps, make sure to just take them and then anoint them. What do we do with the anoints and which ones do we use? Which oils do we use? So if you are having problems learning the basics still, and if you are just a beginner to blight maps, I would highly recommend you use one or even two amber oils because what they do is they reduce the cost of building and upgrading towers. So um, the other important one that is nice to know is that if you feel comfortable, make sure that if you start running with two amber oils, start running it with one. See how fast your building, uh, building cost is going to increase and see if you are comfortable with running it like that. Now, the uh, teal oils, what they do is they make it 50 seconds shorter, basically, um, per teal oil. Teal oils all are cheap, so are amber oils. So these things are just quality of life things. So if you want to blast through blight maps a little bit faster, um, what you could possibly do is just do something like this. So place as many towers, chill out for four minutes, loot, and then leave, right? Um, necessarily something that I like to run, uh, is also crimson oils. Usually crimson oils, um, add another, uh, variety of items that in 12 blight chests that they are lucky and you have increased pack size, but whatever, we want those lucky chests. So sometimes what I usually like to run is either a teal oil and two crimson oils, which means that we have a shorter blight map as well as more of those blight chests that are lucky or for easier quality of life I don't really care about strategizing my towers something like this we want those additional rewards we want to juice up our maps a little bit more in order to get those nice 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 drops right so for example let's just anoint this one map since mud geyser is quite a bad layout. Now, you can probably check on the wiki what layouts do certain maps have, but essentially you can also think of it this way that most maps, when they have a certain 
uh, layout, like for example Mudgeyser, you know that the Mudgeyser map is a round circle with a little, you know, water uh, lake in the middle, so it's an open area map. Crimson Temple, for example, isn't really an open area map, it does have some certain open areas, however, usually there are tunnels. Now why is it important to run nice layout maps, or why are nice layout maps easier, and what are nice layout maps? Nice layout maps are uh, when multiple lanes can be affected by one single tower. So monkey explanation time, monkey have tower. Tower has AoE effect. AoE effect for one lane, not good. AoE effect for multiple lane, good. AoE effect, effective. When have small tunnel, blight root go through AoE effect more often. That's basically it. So this is why we want to run like these layouts that are more cramped. The more cramped it is, the more like towers we can use to as much effectiveness as possible. So that also in the same time reduces our cost of placing towers. If we have an open area and we have to place towers on every single lane, then that's going to up our cost. But if we can place one tower that affects three lanes, for example, then that's going to be definitely much, much easier. You can see that these lanes actually overlap all the way over here. So the cysts actually are over here, and this is how they are, like, you know, how you can see them in the map. And they are going to be overlapping through these corridors. So it's nice to just put a couple of those freezing towers in these corridors, which will allow it to slow down any other mobs that will be passing through here once there is more lanes right so for now there aren't many lanes but we want to freeze them as much as possible down here so also an empowering tower empowers the towers around it meaning that if we have a chilling tower we have a seismic tower and we have our empowering tower all of these mobs that are going to be here eventually once our other towers won't be as effective they will be frozen stunned and both things combined will just basically make them perma stunned and not allowed you and, and it won't allow you to get into those that that cyst and like I mentioned, help out Cassia, help out your towers a little bit, it are, well, lucky chests. So also another thing to mention when doing blight maps, it's very important to see, like I mentioned before, to have as much effectiveness as possible of our towers. So we can see here that we do have a chilling tower, so they are immune to the freeze damage, but they are not a few immune to the freeze stun, which is also really nice. We can see how these blight maps, they, the lines, they go through here. So, for example, they cross over here. So I guess it's a good idea to just place like a freezing tower right over here. And then another good idea to probably place like a seismic tower over here. So now if we also place an empower tower and we place our damage over here. Now what we have is all this tower is in a, Now we have all of these towers in effect. All of them are buffed as well. Oh, well, this one isn't it's just right on the edge, but that doesn't matter. That's fine. And now all of these maps, when these mobs start coming over here, this has increased effectiveness. Um, this also ha will have some effect on the mobs, obviously. It will, it will keep stunning them. And well, this one, it's just going to be empowered as well. Now we can see another line. It goes through here and here. We can see that there's like a certain choke point. We want to make sure that these mobs in this choke point that they stay there. We want to keep preserving those choke points and making sure that those mobs, they are going to be frozen there. We do not want them to move out of there. Look here again, we have another choke point. We can see that they are passing through here. So we place the seismic tower, we place that, we place that, we make sure that that seismic tower is also going to have some buff effect as well as this. Um, and that's basically it. These are the only towers we have for all of those mobs. Look at that. These are the only towers that we have for all of those mobs. And they're doing fine. We only have a seismic, a freeze tower with a little bit of empower on it, and that's all. Look, see I placed those freeze towers? They're frozen here. They can't do shit. They're not doing anything. Let's also place a seismic since we have a lot of choke points right here, right? It all goes to this one point. So that's why it's important to put them. And well, now, once you have the choke points already done and ready, there's no real point of doing anything else besides, well, some damage towers. They're just going to eliminate the monsters quicker, uh, make sure that the boss depletes a little bit faster, 
And essentially, that's all you really need to do. Also, what I like to do for extra defenses, there are certain mobs that like to run out of the lines, uh, which are a little bit sneaky and tricky. So once that timer reaches around zero almost, careful for those. Those are volatiles and you have uh, toxic volatiles and you have like uh, the fire volatiles that leave some burning ground on the ground, which isn't really good and that can kill you. And this is also a little bit of uh, some good XP. See, this is what I meant. You have these mobs sometimes. Sometimes they just like to chase you, uh, it's good to just have that freezing tower just in case, or like these wheel cart mobs, whatever they are. Once this timer starts reaching a uh, low time, let's just start cleaning up, let's help our towers out a little bit. Quick recap about the strategy. We have our sextants, we have our blight taken on the atlas tree, which will be linked in the description. We have a little bit of harvest, which is some extra currency, and we have our... Uh, we have our strong boxes which is also a little bit of extra currency and we have our boss map drop which is another bit of extra currency because it's always nice to get a conqueror map or any other map like that we also have the uh, eater of world altar which gives us additionally more quantity or as well sometimes well i'm just running it hoping for um the divine altar but you, you you can absolutely just go, it's it's extra currency, it's extra something that you can get from the map. That, that's the only reason why these things are there. For the strategy, all you essentially really need is this. This is the most important part. This is why we are doing this strategy. This is the node that allows us to make those maps drop. And this allows us to also give us the oils. This allows us to then complete all of these damn maps that we already accumulated after only 12 maps with the investment which I told you about before and all of those things combined continues on like this constant currency roll because you will be dropping a lot of oils you will be dropping a lot of normal maps right because look in our dump tab if we look like on just on map look at how many maps we have like and like, how many crimson temples we dropped and we are also going to be dropping them from those blight cysts inside of our blighted maps so now once we run all of these we're almost guaranteed to get at least another like 10 Crimson Temple maps at least that we can then roll again and just all can go with two scarabs and then drop another 14, uh, 10, 12, you know, that's completely random. You might not even get a single one, but usually on average what I've been getting is at least like 8 to 15 maps from those 12 maps. And then you just run those 12 maps again, and then you can just continue that. Or you can do a bigger sample size. Let's say that you just want to run a full damn tab, uh, and you want to run like 128 maps. You can run 128 maps, get that all ready, and then run like 300 blighted maps if you want. I might even do that soon. I might be doing that in a live stream during this weekend. So hope to see you there. And I hope that you will enjoy this strategy, and it's just it's just a currency, constant currency roll. I love it. Thanks, and see you later. I love you guys. Bye.